good afternoon everyone so welcome to the weekly colloquium of uh, school of astrophysics today uh, is the second colloquium of this semester so we have as a speaker professor indranil chattopadhyay from eris so it's my pleasure to introduce today's uh, speaker So, Professor Chattopadhyay did his undergraduate as well as masters from University of Calcutta. Then he uh, joined as a PhD student in the uh, SN Bose National Center for Basic Sciences, where he worked with uh, Professor Sundip Chakraborty uh, towards a doctoral degree. Then he went to uh, postdoc. Uh, He held uh, two postdoc position, one in Belgium and then in South Korea. And finally, in 2007, he joined uh, Aries as a faculty position. So, talking about uh, Aries and uh, Professor Chakrabarty, I should mention that when we started the MSc uh, MSc thesis back in 2015 or 2016, was the first batch. Where we had the MSc thesis in the uh, physics department. So at that time, the uh, the thesis was uh, one semester long. Final entire final semester was thesis, and student had the opportunity to work in some other places, going to some other institute and do there this project work there. And our student Shilpa Sharkar. she took that opportunity and went to aries and did her master master thesis there and finally she again joined professor chatterbadhyay for her phd degree and i guess she has already got her degree she has already got her degree professor chatterbadhyay so without further delay let me invite professor chatterbadhyay for giving to this colloquy <laughs> With all introductions, I didn't do that. You can hear me, right? Yeah. Uh, in all introductions, people give give a lot of you know, accolades to the speaker. Okay. Many a times they don't deserve that, uh, but anyway, I'll take that. Okay. All right. So, uh, and there's another thing. What are those? What are those? Yeah. All right. Uh, So I will be talking about uh, effect of composition in in solution phenomena. Okay. Uh, so let me just first introduce a little bit about uh, many of you know because Vikobar is here. He he sort of was an expert in these fields. So many of you know about it, but anyway, still I'll. I'll try to introduce a little bit about it. Okay, so uh, accretion is the best model to explain the luminosity of spectra and timing properties in AGNs and microfluidics. Okay. What are AGNs? AGNs are uh, centers of active galaxies where uh, there is uh, at the center that you have a massive black hole, one or two massive black holes. So you have one candidate in, is Uh, projected as having a binary massive, uh, a pair of massive black holes in a in a uh, in the depth down as they call it. Uh, but anyway, in general, it is the uh, a, a black hole which is actually accreting a lot of matter, also ejecting a lot of matter as well. And these are called active galactic nuclei. The central mass can range from 10 to the power six photon mass, way upwards 10 to the power nine. Close to 10 to the power 10, and microquasars are uh, are extra binary actually. You have one compact object and one uh, secondary to the normal star, and that normal star is uh, uh, revolving around that uh, compact object. And uh, if the compact object object might be a uh, black hole, it might be a neutron star. So there are the, the neutron star uh, microquasar behaves slightly different than uh, black hole uh, neutron stars, 
But anyway, uh, so the microquasars are it's a binary, as you can call it. And why they are called microquasars in 1990s, uh, um, Mirabel and Rodriguez wrote a paper in Nature where they showed one particular uh, microquasar, which is ejecting jets, and those are relativistic jets. Because quasars are quasi stellar. Quasi-stellar? No, that is QSO. But anyway, it's a quasi-stellar object. I'm forgetting that how the quasar term came from this. How the acronym was, um, was given. But anyway, so uh, so, this, so quasars, you have a lot of attrition, a lot of luminosity, and you have relativistic jets. So in that particular object, they showed that you have a relativistic ejection as well as ejection. And uh, then uh, they also discovered something, uh, a very famous microquasar called GR191105. You know what is what is actually means. GRS is the satellite, and 1915 plus 105 are the declinations and the array date of the, the object in the sky. Uh, so that, uh, uh, they also wrote another uh, uh, paper where they showed that the ejections are traveling with really relative speed of 90%. So then they call it microquasar because it's a small quasar, behaving like a small And uh, apart from uh, accretion, you also have jets and outflows which are associated with these objects. Uh, so what we know about them, broadly what we know about them, we know that the jet states of these micro, this is, this is a tiny uh, analysis, not AGL. AGL, you don't see objects changing over in time. There are variabilities. Okay? Don't confuse it with variability. This is for my, for, okay. Uh, for microquasars, the state, accretion state changes over a period of two months. Okay. So, if you want to see time properties, you should look into microquasars. Yeah. And you expect that because the central object is black hole, which is a very democratic, uh, you know, compact object, treats everybody same, that everybody has to fall into it with the speed of light. Okay. So, uh, and it does not have any horizon, so it does not have a structure. So that way it's very democratic. So we believe, everybody believes that, that the massive black holes and the smaller black holes, they will behave similarly, at least close to, the, uh, to their, to their uh, domain. Uh, so, so these, uh, the jets that are coming out, they are correlated with accretion state. In the microquasar, this has been established. The jet states are, there are canonical two states. One is called the hard state. The hard state means that most of the emitted electromagnetic radiation peaks in the hard x -ray. So this is a Cygnus X1 spectra, and you have a thermal bump. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it. It is assumed to be coming from a Kepler ring jet. As of now, nobody has imaged an accretion disk. Okay. An accretion disk has been imaged for some white dwarf, some hardy hero uh, objects, Accretion and jet has been uh, imaged. Okay, sorry, not white dwarf, white dwarf. Uh, for YSA, okay, it has been uh, uh, imaged. Not in case of any compact. Okay. okay, so this is called hard X-ray. So you have this thermal bump coming from a, uh, uh, from a Keplerian disk, <laughs> supposed to come from Keplerian disk, and then you have this. Hard power law. Okay, this is assumed again to be a uh, result of inverse compromisation of these soft photons. Okay. 
This is the extra domain. You can see it's in KE. The second one is the second uh, uh, state, which is uh, generally speaking uh, assumed to be the two, you know, uh, uh, permanent states of, of uh, microquasars. Is that called the soft state? Here you see it peaks. The power peaks in the soft part of the X-ray, and you have a weaker power. However, however, this is a very old, I think it's early 2000 or late, uh, uh, late 1990 uh, plot. This, this is taken from one of the papers of Putin. Okay. And uh, later on, people found out that, okay, there is not one power law, there are multiple power laws and so on. Okay. Now, what has been seen that during this hard state, jet activity starts, and during this soft state, there is no jet activity. Okay. And then uh, Thomas Belloni and uh, Rob Fender uh, published this uh, cartoon diagram, which is a sort of a hysteresis curve. In, in this side, you have the intensity, and in that side, you have the hardness of it. You don't see the jet. You don't see any radio at the end. So, so this is this figure where you have on, on the y-axis you have the intensity of the radiation and here is the hardness ratio. Hardness ratio is the ratio between total hard flux, hard flux mean that is coming from this power law, okay, and the total soft flux. So uh, it, it's there. And many of the these microquasars in their outbursting states, they show this hysteresis kind of a, um, uh, of this, this, uh, this behavior. So this is called the quiescent state where it is almost not detected. And then you have this state, which is called the hard state, where it is detected, but the luminosity is low, but most of it is in the hard radiation. And then, and when it is the hard state, the radioactivity is just seen. Okay, so you have a weaker jet, and then it grows, the intensity grows, still being in the hard state, and then it goes to the soft state. Before going to the soft state, you see this relative okay. Is it the uh, No, no, this is, uh, this is an average, statistical. So, Single uh, objects always don't behave like that. Some of them will go up to here and it will it will be there all the time. Okay, there is DRS 1915105. It never comes to this state. It, it is somewhere, I mean, sort of moving around that state. Okay. But this is an overall picture of I think about hundreds of microquasars. So overall, all the objects behave like I guess not. Okay. Because if you have accretion state, you will basically see why you have jet. If I try to feed you more than you can, can you know, digest, you will feed. So that's it. So you, you, are, you are putting too much, too much matter, a part of them for various reasons. Why they're polymerated and so on is a different thing. All right, so basically we have this sort of a hysteresis that you have a low hard state, from there it goes to an intermediate state, hard intermediate, soft intermediate. Hard intermediate means these states where it is still hard, you still have a very strong hard radiation, but luminosity has gone up. Okay. And it is slightly little less hard than the typical hard state. Then you go to the so, uh, soft intermediate states, and before this hard to soft intermediate state, you have the, and then you come back to the uh, soft state. All right. So this is it goes on. All right. So that's what I. Oh, another thing is that um, in this uh, low hard state and in these intermediate states, 
the power law part of the photon to see possibility of this. Two of the years of the power law part, it shows uh, possibility of this. Right? Okay, so that's what we have. So uh, now, why the jets are launched? Okay, there are many, many, many models. None of them answer properly, or all parts of what what we see in jet. Okay, and it is very, it is very, I should say, it should be expected because there are a lot of fluids here, a lot of plasma here. Plasma behaves in very, very notorious manner. It is not one charge particle moving to magnetic field. It is a collection of interacting particles. They, they are they are notorious. Okay. So they will not behave exactly. One will not behave exactly the same as the other. Okay. All right. So this is the M87 jet, uh, which is which has been measured and I mean, which has observed for 20 years. And then, then all the radio images have been stacked to give this beautiful matter. I mean, this movie of matter go and detect the uh, from the M87. So center is the M87 uh, black hole. So what has been inferred thus far is this accretion onto black hole is translativistic uh, in nature. That is, at large distance, the flow is non-relativistic. Close to the horizon, it is relativistic. Jets are thermally relativistic near the base, but relativistic speed. But thermal is non-relativistic at large distances, distances while achieving you know, uh, very high kinetic energy. The measurement of the speeds of relativistic jets is also questionable. Okay. Do not believe everything that is written on paper okay. because of projection effect. You actually do not know whether the jet is going like this or coming towards you. The, the angle, the, 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 the angle between its ejection and your line of sight, that is inferred from other on the sky, you see moving faster than the speed of light. Okay. That is essentially a projection effect. So basically, what you see is a projection, right? So now you have this ob one object moving with certain angle with, with respect to you, right? It's going from here to there. All right. So it is actually covering a shorter distance in the same time. And you see it's moving like this. All right. So if you calculate what is the speed of this object, so something is here and something is there, right? One blob is here and another blob is there. But you see it like it is moving like this, right? Okay. So you see one blob and then you again see the other blob. And this is a smaller distance. If you calculate, you'll find that the speed is much higher than what it is. But if that is the case, then you can draw, you can actually figure out, if you look at, I mean, take all the Lorentz transformation, etc., and you plot the apparent velocity, uh, sorry, the actual velocity with respect to theta, if you vary the projection angle, okay, then you will see a minimum value. Whenever it is seen that there is a supernovular uh, uh, motion, then the, the lower limit you will see is at least around 80% of the speed. So there you know it is Whatever it is, it is relevant. The speeds of jets are inferred, generally speaking, from various considerations. One is that if it is forming a low, radio low, then the radio law has been existing for a certain time, right? And then you have this electron direction, uh, you know, uh, time scale. So most of the time, it is not one single electron, right? There are many electrons. So you can actually calculate how many of these electrons we lose, we lose after collisions and all, we lose from that block. From there you can sort of measure what is the time, I mean, its age of that, typical age of that, uh, you know, radio load. 
and then you can say that what fraction of matter supply you have to have to maintain that load compared to its loss time. Okay. From there you know what is the rate of mass that is being supplied, and from there you can estimate what you need. I mean, speed of it. Uh, okay. So there are various other ways. Other ways. If you actually see a line emission, then from there also you can. But anyway, all of them are uh, or inferred. Okay. All right, and then uh, the point is these are very hot. Okay. The other thing you see that from the spectrum you can figure out what are the temperatures involved. And the electron temperature is almost, almost always greater than the 9K. And uh, therefore the plasma around the compact object are fully ionized, has to be fully ionized and thermally relativistic. Okay. Now I'm coming to what we are going to talk about. Now, so the matter around uh, these compact objects are so squished that they should be in the in the uh, fluid state, so like a fluid. Like a fluid right? okay. Now, if that is the case, then we can apply the fluid mechanics to fluid. Okay. And Hydrodynamics is very well studied, although it's a very nonlinear set of equations, very well studied for Newtonian. Okay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> so, what do you mean by Newtonian? We, it is assumed that the gas particles which make up the gas or the plasma in the fluid state, they are all executing, executing, uh, uh, motion with the with, with non relativistic speed. And if you do that, then you can find out that there is something called the adiabatic index, okay, which is called, uh, which is represented by the capital gamma, and that can vary from gamma by 4 thirds to 5 thirds, etc, etc, okay. So this is what you do. So if you, if you assume that it is uh, uh, non relativistic particles, then your maxwell Boltzmann, if you distribute in maxwell Boltzmann distribution, then the distribution will be something like this, where omega is the instant, uh, random velocity. And from there, you can actually calculate the average energy of these particles, okay, which is called the thermal energy. Okay. And so that can, you can show that it, it is something like P by gamma minus 1, okay. gamma being the adiabatic energy. For relativistic gas, most of the people, what they do with this Newtonian estimate, they add the rest of energy. And then they call it. All right. So this expression of the internal energy or this average energy density of the particles is called the equation of state of gas because actually fluid equations are essentially underspecified because you have five equations and you have six variables. Okay. And the closure relation between the thermodynamic variables is called the equation of state or closure. Uh, so that is the energy relation of energy density with the pressure. Okay. You need to specify that. Now, if you know, assume those particles to be relativistic, then your energy of the particles will be something like this. Now you integrate them and take average and find out what will be the energy density. Then you get the relativistic energy. Uh, density of the particles, and uh, so it's something like this. And this was found out by Chandrasekhar a long time back, and then it was re-derived by Singe and then Cox and G. All right. But the problem with this equation state is that it has the Bessel, modified Bessel function, and modified Bessel function is very notorious thing to handle in, in numerical simulation codes because when you have a numerical simulation code. Then first of all, you have to deal with various frames, right? One is the frame which is the lab frame when you are looking, right? Then there is a co-moving frame. So when you are doing this transformation, so these vessel modified vessels functions should be involved. So you have to transform or re-transform with these notorious things, and the code might get uh, can get broken down. It might it will take a if it doesn't break down. It will take a much longer time to do this transformation 
and you have to do it at every point, right? So generally speaking, ports become computationally expensive. So what we did, that also a long time ago, that we proposed another equivalent state, okay, which is a very close fit of the symmetrical equivalent state. All right. And uh, how close I can show. Okay, so uh, the good thing is that, that it is now an algebraic equation. Okay, just an algebraic equation of temperature. Theta is a temperature. All right, and then it, it does not. It is not computationally expensive. It will take exactly the same time if you use uh, uh, the Newtonian sort of equivalent state and R equivalent state. Uh, it, we did uh, initially what we did, we fitted the synthetical equation of state, various functions it fits. Then there is something else as well. So there is an inequality called, called tau equivalent. Okay. So in 1948, tau actually uh, for relativistic gas, he showed, he, he implemented the Schwartz inequality in the uh, Equation for fluid mechanics and show that there is a lower limit of these uh, uh, that uh, the, the impact of the flow will will, will on it. Okay, so we implemented that as well. Okay. So it is it's a very close fit. I can show you. So now what happens is that. The adiabatic index is no more a constant, it depends on temperature, as well as what composition you have. So whether your relativistic gas is composed of electrons and protons, or you have positrons as well, or something else. All right? So this is a, a, a comparison. OK, uh, the, the solid here and the long dash are the uh, this for electron positron and this is for electron positron. Photons are not in thermal equilibrium with the gas. So if you have to have the photons in the equation of state, then they have to be in thermal equilibrium. It is optically thin, yeah. If you can say it's optically thin, it can be optically slim as well. Okay. So what we do, okay, I'll just tell you what we do. Okay. So you can see it is very close fit. Okay, at no temperature range, it is sort of disobeying the thermal equation of state. But the point is that it is it's very uh, good for us. Computationally, it takes absolutely no extra time. Okay, so now the uh, accretion disk models, and I will implement, but before, uh, what are various accretion models? I'll just give you um, one sec, uh, one uh, 30 seconds. Right. Okay, so I have written here the uh, the Euler equation in the Newtonian scheme because it's easier to explain it in Newtonian because our logic system is from that. So you have the so this is a uh, Newtonian equation of uh, the Euler equation in in uh, so in Newtonian regime. So you have the momentum density the time rate and you have the flux of the momentum density the pressure gradient term the uh, the gravity term and you have the centripetal or centrifugal the way you look at it through the centrifugal okay so it's written in in cylindrical coordinate system all right so now the bondi accretion flow is a radial flow so what you do is it, it is steady state, so steady state means the time dependence goes off, exclusive time dependence. And uh, it is bondy flow, so only radial velocity components are there. <coughs> so we get rid of the Vz and the angular momentum term. All right. So then you have this term, this term, and this term. Solve that, that is the radial flow and the bondy flow. So basically, you have a central object and matter is falling radial from every side. All this time. Okay. So that's bondy accretion disk. Then you have the Keplerian disk. Okay. Keplerian disk is more popular, very popular. 
So in Keplerian disk, what you do is you can have the same equation. Now, it does not have any objection. So all velocity terms except the V phi term or the angular momentum term, all of them are equal to zero. And in the radial equation, you also get rid of the dp dr. So then you have only two terms left. Okay? Solve this with energy generation and energy loss. What you get is the Kepler disk. Okay? All right. Then you have also thick disk. Okay, there are Keplerian disks and a lot of problems. Okay. So I'm not going to details of that. So thick disk. So thick disk was, pro uh, was proposed by the Polish group. Okay. Okay. So what do you take? You take the same equation. All of them have they have their relativistic angle. So <clears throat> Here, what you do again, you get rid of all the advection terms. <coughs> you take only the pressure gradient. Solve it. What you get is a thick disk. <coughs> all right. So, so, so what we do? What we do? We solve all the terms. <coughs> so you have the T mu nu for the matter. You have T menu for the radiation, you have T menu for the. All right. And we solve. Of course, we don't solve all the time everything. Whatever you want to look into, <coughs> So, first, what we'll show is steady state solution. Okay. All right. And see how. Uh, I mean, uh, equation, I mean, composition might affect. The point was because in non relativistic uh, hydrodynamics or in magnetic hydrodynamics, the, the, the structure does not have any information of composition. Therefore, solutions never depend on composition. Okay. But because the equation of state already, the xi is the proportion of. Electron to superdot. Okay. So it, it already contains the information of composition inside the equation. Right. So it will be. And you see, if you look at this plot, this is the adiabatic index versus temperature, then anything which is less than 10 to the power 7 don't depend on composition. Anything which is beyond 10 to the power 30. Of course, if you want to do 13, it will not be a normal gas. Probably it will be for uh, uh, one long term. But anyway, forget about that at the moment. So it will not depend on the composition. But in between these temperature range, it will depend on the composition. Electron positrons, from where we get electron positrons. We'll talk about the same if we get time. But uh, it, I mean, at the moment, we are saying that there is electron and positron. Okay. We to be neutral. So, does that, that flow behave somewhat differently than the electron flow? All right. And actually, I think there's no problem in the end of the Yeah, you need to so come. So this photon need not be in, in, in the thermal equilibrium with the uh, you can have uh, you dress down and things like that. Okay. Okay. So how do we solve uh, let's forget it. So how do we solve? So we solve it something like this, this is an integral solution. So one thing to know is that fluid mechanics solutions. They actually admit multiple solutions. Okay. This is, I'm giving you the same Bernoulli parameter, okay, and say same uh, angular momentum, everything the same, okay. So, and from near the horizon, I'm giving a guess value of temperature and okay. If I do that, I'll get this kind of a solution. If I change that temperature a little bit, I'll get that kind of a solution. 
and it can sort of give me zoo of things. All right. Just holding particles, velocity. Not particles, because me. Two elements. Two elements. So single, single velocity, and a function. Uh, not this is not time. This is R. This, this is R. Okay. Time, temporal variable, we can't make. And this uh, physical one is uh, what velocity like? Light. Light, not sound. No. This is this is GRC. So it's already the uh, uh, this is horizon. Okay, so black hole horizon. Are you so this one this. This is 10 means 10 social radius. So this is one. So this is uh, passing to talk or not? No, no, at the moment we can talk here. Just we are trying to find the thing. So that's uh, but that is the same relationship. No, I'm I'm integrating it from near the horizon. Okay, near the horizon to record that one. I can do the other way as well. No, but in general, it's very difficult to integrate over the uh, uh, the point is, if you start, okay, we will discuss it later. If you start from outside, the outer boundary condition can be so varied, okay, you will miss most of the interesting things. Better to start from very near the uh, either horizon or the circle. Okay. There, you will know exactly how many solutions are coming. Mm -hmm. okay. So, this is, this is the genius of Okay. He's, he's extremely fast. And when he actually did all these things, I think in the world, one or two people knew about it. And one of the reasons why his models are never popular, it is very difficult to understand. Okay. And we understood it first, and then we started to figure out what the other things are there. Anyway, so. <clears throat> I'm coming to that. So these are have the same boundary parameter. Okay. Boundary parameter is basically the energy, right? Okay. Of right? What are the difference? How they are different? Why they are others are different? It's because of the energy. So because of the collection of interacting particles, they are not just. I mean, a particle is always, you know, governed by its energy, right? A fluid which is interacting uh, particles, a number of interacting particles. They are characterized by energy as well as entropy. Okay. This is the highest entropy solution, or the one which is called transform, which is passing through the function. Okay. This is the argument Bondi gave in his seminal paper. So why this solution? Even for Newtonian stars, a transonic solution is the most expected, most favored solution. Uh, given a chance, a fluid will try to find a transonic solution. It will become transonic near a strong gravity. So we find uh, transonic solutions like this, and then we find all sorts of other solutions. And if you do that, this is, uh, okay, I'm coming to this. This is Mach number versus the radius. Okay. And this is the Bernoulli parameter, and this is the angular number. Okay. Now, if you have radial flow, and you have a gravity, gravity center, matter will radially fall, right? And then why it would be transonic? Why should it cross the function? Why a matter which is falling in has to be transonic? The reason is that what does gravity do? Gravity attracts, right? So it will increase its kinetic energy in polynomial, right? It has nothing to do with, with uh, thermodynamics of the field. But what it does, if it, from, a, from a very large distance, you have this whole sphere of, of uh, fluid, partial. You are now confining to a smaller volume. What it does is a secondary effect, it increases its temperature. 
So its primary effect is to increase its velocity. Its secondary effect is also to increase its temperature. Okay. But the rate of increase in temperature or sound speed is slower, the rate is slower than the rate of increase in velocity. So at some point it will cross. Okay. You need not have a black hole for that purpose. Even a Newtonian star will do the same. Okay. All right. But there's a difference between a Newtonian star and a black hole. I don't think I will discuss that. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, so now you have, so if you have a gravity center, everything will fall. Right. Now, if it's rotating along with its radial motion, if it's also rotating, then the part of the energy that you that was you have supplied, the E that you have supplied, the boundary parameter that you have supplied, will go into its kinetic energy as well. So its speed, the radial flow will go down. Okay. Alright. So it will take some time, more time to, to, to cross. The, uh, the the uh, sound speed, local sound speed. Okay. And if you look at the way the centripetal force behaves and the gravity behaves, far off from the central object, the gravity behaves like one by r squared, right? Far off, I mean, forget about it's not very close to the horizon. And the, centri uh, and the centripetal force will behave, behave like if the angular moment is constant, it's one by r cube. Okay, the rate of increase of the rotational energy in the Bernoulli parameter, you know, term is fast, actually faster than in the rate of increase of the gravity. Okay. So somewhere in between, the centimeter, the rotational energy will sort of try to dominate over its infall energy. Kinetic energy. Okay. All right. But very close to the black hole, gravity overpowers everything. So now, what for the radial flow? What was somewhat like a you know something was falling with a part of it one by r squared, then it is actually going beyond one by r squared. So it's something which is coming slow enough. Okay. Right. Now it is variable. Right. Coming like this, and then it actually stops, and then again, at some point again, it increases. Okay. So that means that you can create multiple sonic points. Okay. You can actually cross the sound speed, but then something will try to stop you. So you will create another sonic point closer. This inner sonic point is a signature of strong Yes. So, so here you see when the angular momentum, so it's taken from over here, right? This, this is the same, all these plots are with the same energy but different angular momentum. When the angular momentum is very low, then you have it, it falls. This is a sonic point, okay? It crosses with one sonic point. You increase the uh, angular momentum a little bit, keeping this energy same. Then you see you have two sonic points here, one here and another there. Okay. You increase it further, okay. The two sonic points are there, but you can see the topology has changed. Right? And if you increase it even further, okay, then the and the rotational energy is so much that it has really to come close to the horizon. Cross the sound Okay, so you can have this kind of solution, right? Okay, and you can show that within this domain, if the energy and angular momentum is within this domain, we'll have this multiple solution. Right. So these are the viscosity. So this is with the viscosity, same thing before. Forget it. That's not important. Now I'm talking about this, this region, okay, this three sonic point region, this region. Okay. Now I'm doing this, now I'm changing xi. 
the proton fraction and thing. This is with electron proton. Okay. Then I decrease the proton fraction a little bit and, in, and compensate with the positron to keep it electrically neutral, only electrically neutral. Then it, I decrease a little bit, it becomes, if we see it has changed. Okay. It becomes a little bit more energetic. I decrease it further, more energetic. Decrease it further, more energetic. Now I can start from here. I could not plot all of them because they will get jumbled up. Now if we increase it, uh, decrease it further, it is becoming less energetic, less energetic. And this is for xi equals to 0 0.01. That means in the flow, you have only 1% uh, protons. And you see that it has become the three sonic point region is almost limited. For, for xi equals to 0 or electron polytron, three sonic point doesn't exist. Okay. Why is it so? Why <coughs> So, so what happens? So then, I mean, if it is well, something is relativistic, it can be relativistic because of two aspects, right? One is because of its kind of speed, right? Slow the speed of light. It is a collection of particles, interacting particles, gas is another thing, right? So which is a thermal energy. So a thermal, if a gas is relativistic, if it is if it is if it is uh, of the order or greater than its rest mass energy or rotation. Okay. So initially keeping the same temperature, if I in decrease the protons, number of protons, I'm decreasing the rotation. Okay. So it becomes thermally more relevant. Okay. <coughs> temperature may not be more. But if I actually decrease the number of protons too much, then a counter thing happens. Why? Because the protons, if I give the same push for proton on electron, the proton will transfer its momentum at least 2,000 times more. <coughs> if you actually devoid a proton, same energy, the transfer of uh, momentum will be less. It will become, it will become less. All right, so not well seen. Anyway, <clears throat> so uh, this is I have taken uh, one spot here, this one, okay, and I have plotted for electron uh, posit proton, elect fifty percent electron. Uh, yeah, this is electron proton, this is electron 50% uh, uh, protons, and this is electron positron. You see, the, the topology, the nature of the solution has changed. This, I mean, I don't know why it is so bad. Here it is looking okay. <laughs> All right. Achha, this is a simulation of uh, these accretion solution. Okay, now we have developed numerical simulation codes to check that was. So this is a, a smooth solution. So this is with xi equals to one. Okay. So this is without any shock or something. This one is with a shock. So we inject with uh, values which we have taken from the analytical solution. Analytical solution for the shock. So we are trying, this is basically code verification. Okay. So it's still not steady state. Okay, I'll I'll skip this. All right. Takes time. 
it has it has still not has reached the steady state now it has okay so if if i take one snapshot after it reached the steady state the match the the solid ones of the analytical ones and the dot i mean the circles are distributed well and they match pretty well so the codes are fine okay the shock has been resolved it should have been resolved in one cell but we managed one two three four five six which is more than acceptable in the world so here what we have done is that we started with the same uh, our shock solution with for xi equals to one, but we took we gave if all, everything same, we changed the xi, and we we saw that the shock went away. What was admitting a shock, it's not giving any shock. Okay. So it's clearly showing that if whatever composition you are taking, it is affecting the composition. I mean the flow solution. <clears throat> so this is forget about this. Okay. So <clears throat> another thing is <clears throat> like if you have viscosity, if you if you distort it, distort it right here, those the previous ones were in the code checking. But uh, in in case of uh, if you give viscosity, what happens is that if viscosity it will what we will do it will sort of transform the angular momentum. So now, if you have a steady state shock and you are uh, transporting angular momentum, the post shock region, the density is higher and the temperature is higher, right? So, there is what we will do if we try to transport angular momentum. So, if you try to pile up angular momentum, okay. So, once you pile up angular momentum, what it will do is try to push the shock front out. The moment you push the shock front out, the inner part becomes a little less and the temperature becomes a little less. Okay, so the thermal gradient force takes over. So it will try to bring it back. And if there is a, if it attains a, some sort of an equilibrium, then it will start. So that's what is happening here. So now if I change the viscosity, uh, sorry, the, uh, the composition to 50% proton, the electron proton has whatever is electrons and same number of protons. Now I've reduced the protons by 50% and added uh, all the okay. So now you see the rest of the things are same. It is oscillating, but you know, in a very sluggish manner. And after some time, it will sort of become steady state. And in, if I reduce no, this is not 50%, this is 80%. So, so this is 50%. It does not operate at all. Okay. So if you look at the shock location with time, so it goes like this and then it oscillates. Okay, for the equals to one, the same thing we showed. For point A, it's sort of giving and then slowly it's becoming steady state. And this one becomes listed even earlier. Okay. So this is thickness configuration. This is with xi equals to zero or electron positron. This is with 50 percent. This is electron proton. See the structure of a thickness is also changing. Let's talk about jets. Okay, how much time did I have? So it's good enough to show only movies now. So this is with xi equals to one. We have launched it with this, uh, the Lorentz factor, I remember. It is Lorentz factor, it's launched in Lorentz factor 10. Okay. And uh, um, uh, the, but we have kept the Mach number same. Mach number is Lorentz factor by the constant. Right. So, <clears throat> So this is with uh, electron proton jet. This is 50% uh, protons. Okay. The structures are completely different. This is electron positron. See, it's almost disrupting the jet. So if you take them at the same snapshot, 
the you see the 50 percent jet is about to leave the domain time the electron proton jet is following but electron positron jets lag behind by a, by a large distance okay it's about uh, in kpc right so this is this is a jet head uh, it's less than 175 kpc and this is like around 200 200 kpc okay. and not only that if you look at the jet structure they are completely different I can go on, on, I mean, how the shock, various number of shock changes, the shock uh, compression rate changes, the shock temperature change. I can go on that, but let's not do that again. Okay, so, <clears throat> so the jet head position with time, if I plot this, the red one is dipole to, I mean, the electron positron, uh, the, the, this dash dot is electron proton and the dash is the 50 percent proton uh 50 percent protons and you can see that uh the with the ones with the protons are faster but again you cannot say which one will be faster it will depend on the interaction so in case of jets the matter goes hits and come back and interact okay so they are changing the xi in between the or the composition in between because of mixing. Okay. You have the ambient medium, you also have the material, right? So they're also mixing. So whatever you are choosing and whatever you are keeping, they are not remaining the same when they start mixing. So you cannot predict which, I mean, if, if you launch with xi plus to zero or xi plus to one or whatever, which one will be faster? You cannot say that. It will depend on what kind of mixing they have. Then, thermodynamics, local thermodynamics will change, and that will give you different Okay. So this is the reverse shock position. Okay. Uh, let me move. This is the same enthalpy jet. So now what we have done, so we have checked everything. This paper is, has been submitted recently. So we said that, okay, in fluid dynamics, in jet simulation, whatever has been assigned as the, the one that actually dictates what kind of jet we will have. If the jets are of the same enthalpy, they are supposed to produce the same jet. If it is assumed to be have the same Mach number, they are supposed to be the same jet. The Mach number I showed, the enthalpy I am showing now, that you can again see that this is xi uh, equals to zero, this is 20% proton, this is 50%, this is electron proton. The, if you look at these, you can see that the, the location of the jet head is different, or the propagation speed is different. Okay, this is the temperature. So if you plot the temperature, you can see the the structure inside the jet is different. All right. Now, if I look at, if I plot the synchrotron emission, okay. And again, if you plot synchrotron emission, I have to say uh, which uh, direction I'm looking. So this is like 90 degree. 90 degree means if this is the jet and these are the lobes and I'm looking from here. All right. So this is the synchrotron map, emissivity map. Okay. You see here the jet is not al almost not seen, right? Why? Because <coughs> these are Lorentz factor 10 jet. <coughs> so all the radiation are boosted along the flow of the jet. <coughs> we only see the cocoon or the uh, radio loop. All right. In this, I don't have many. Uh, this is <clears throat> hydrodynamic jet. We have assumed the jet as the gas pressure is equal to 90% gas pressure. <clears throat> All right. Now, this is with 60 degrees. So the jet is going like this. We are looking somewhere like this. The, Still, we don't see the jet, but we still see the that the structure has changed from here. The emissivity has changed, but uh, but of course, they, all the jets are looking fairly different. Now this is forty-five degree. We are about to see the jets, right? Part of the knots, various knots of the jet. <clears throat> this is 
30 degree we see more of the jet okay now the brighter points are with the maximum lorentz factor okay because now because the lorentz factor you are seeing in parts this is 10 degree so now you can see fairly the jet is illuminated okay this is a magnetized jet i'll I forget about the, this one so i can show you one magnetized jet simulation so this is we have just done it it is not yet uh, so this is like um, oh this is density and uh, density contours but okay so here you see this is a density contour z equals to z okay this is z equals to 0 and this is z equals to 1 so this is density contours and this black uh, arrowhead with the velocity vectors so this so this is the the gas pressure and this is the magnetic pressure okay this is the limit all right <clears throat> so if you now for the z equals to 1 again you see the structures are completely different again this is the density contour this is the gas pressure and this is the magnetic pressure so again wherever the gas pressure is high you have low magnetic pressure wherever the magnetic pressure is high you have low gas pressure etc so point to be noted is that uh, composition composition affects solution there is no doubt about it now the question is if i look at what do i see i see radiation can i say if i look at the radiation okay this is made of this composition Right. You see the problem. So in astrophysics, most of the time this is a problem. So how to detect, how to say for sure what is that? We have not reached there. Okay. If I have reached there, it is a nature paper. <clears throat> okay. So uh, what we have done here, we uh, so now as of now we have been putting xi as we have started. So we are putting xi as a parameter. Now we start with xi equals to one, and try to figure out how much radii for which from we can generate. This is done for an accretion uh, problem. You have to do it for jets. All right. So oh, forget about this. Okay. So what we have taken. So there are many ways of you can generate xi I mean, or uh, pa uh, pairs. The gamma gamma reaction, gamma electron, gamma proton, electron electron, proton electron, etc. Et These are not very uh, astrophysically, the, the rates if you calculate, they are very low. So uh, we have only taken the gamma gamma. Okay. And from accretion disk, what you have seen that you see here is 22, right? 10 to the power 22 hertz, right? So that's MeV. Okay. So we can produce uh, pairs. So also, what we have applied to is uh, okay. I'll just look, um, get rid of the, um, the details. Uh, we have only looked into the fossil uh, metric. Okay, I'm not. Uh, the car, because uh, the car, the problem is that it's the car, the angular momentum is coupled with the space time. Right? The calculations are a little bit tougher. So, so that's the reason, uh, but it, it will be done. Okay. So, uh, but what we have seen, if you have not uh, just a normal uh, hmm. car solution. There, what we have seen that the temperatures can be very high around the in, uh, uh, around the Schwarzschild black hole, near the Schwarzschild black hole, the temperatures will be around 10 to 11. I mean, at best. But uh, for around star, it is beyond 10 to 12. I mean, it's like that. You don't have to, you know, uh, perspire a lot to get them. Out. So, solution. Mm -hmm. solution. solution. I mean, I did not show you the temperature for today. Right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think Mach number and all this. 
I'm not. <coughs> what temperature? Uh, solutions. Okay, it might be one temperature here. Hmm? Yeah, this is a jet, of course, and jet temperatures are low. The MHD jet, you can see that this is a around 10 to what 10. Or one. <coughs> all the details gone okay, the only point is that uh, if you have pair production then your electron number is not conserved so for the protons you can use the uh, conserved number but for electrons you don't all right but if you do that then the uh, okay so the dvdr can look like this so these are all the uh, you know the <clears throat> the cooling and uh, heating terms, etc. <clears throat> okay, all right. So what we do, we start with the electron proton, and then we give a dry run. We don't we don't uh, calculate uh, the electron proton. So what we do, give the dry run, we get the temperature, then we calculate the radiation field. From there we calculate how much photons we are getting above one energy because not one energy it should be uh, 511 kV right so double it and one kV one zero two kV right so <clears throat> all, so then we take all those of photons and then we calculate what is the uh, pair production and annihilation so initially it will be pair of So we feed that in the equation again. Solve it again. Okay. We get now a different temperature. Now we have positrons and electrons. So they will annihilate. In the third run, we again calculate for how much will be the production, how much will be the <coughs> okay. And we do that till it, the iteration sort of converges. Once it converges, then it converges by eight or nine. Okay. Sometimes it does not work, but anyway, that's how it is. So, <clears throat> so uh, you can see it starts with uh, electron proton. This is the composition with log, and this is the solution we got. And this is the radiation field I have got okay, from this solution. All right. Then we calculate the second step we did that and now we again recalculate and we still we find the annihilation line the 511 then we so this is now you see the composition is changing right okay ultimately i mean after it it uh, it, it converges we have a more or less pronounced annihilation line so these will change, right? I mean, the first iteration, there is no annihilation line. The second, you will have an annihilation line. The third annihilation line will go down. It might increase as well. It depends on uh, what kind of <coughs> and so on. So and finally, uh, in this particular case, we saw that uh, it is peaking for if the accretion rates are higher. Okay. We also did this with with gamma rays, I mean, the, the, the hydrogen interaction, but I'm not sure. Um, all right. So, so uh, this is what we got. And then from, uh, so now what we have, uh, uh, what we have plotted here is the radiation uh, coming from various regions around the blood. So this is between uh, two to three, two being the Schwarzschild radius, three being the 1.5 Schwarzschild radius. So, <clears throat> so between that, this is you you have this the annihilation line is pretty strong, but if it is between hundred to thousand, then the annihilation line is not there at all. So you add all of them up, and you get this annihilation line. So can we say that the annihilation line is is uh, sort of this is the signature? As yet, 
we cannot because one of the reason is in this region the <coughs> the detection of these lines are I mean, observational detections are not very accurate. Okay. So this would be in event. This is uh, 10 to the, more than 10 to the 20 hertz. hertz. So it will be, yes, less. No, 10 to the 20 is one of these. Right? Yeah, that is 0.5 mm. This is 0.5 mm, yeah. yeah. <coughs> 5 mm, 11, yeah. <coughs> and on the top of that, what we have to do is we have a source, and we have a source. And uh, it is coming through medium, right? Okay. The radiation is coming through certain medium. We are inside uh, Milky Way and lots of things are there. So all those things have to be factored around. So uh, uh, we are far off from telling that what is the signature of the computer. But there has to be a signature situation because not only it is Showing you know effects in MHD the effects are much much higher. Okay. In fact, in one of the papers uh, that was analytical solution, what we saw that when we are comparing with gamma four thousand and gamma five thousand, so what we did, we took the same energy, everything same. Okay, and then we solved it using our equation of state and uh, this gamma five thousand and gamma four thousand compared that. And uh, we saw that for the gamma five third, the temperature distribution is coming higher than the gamma four third distribution. Okay, and ours were coming. I don't remember whether it's green or whatever. So, and the referee also commented that this is very interesting. I mean, it is actually you are naming the point that uh, we need for relativistic uh, studies, we shouldn't take fixed gamma. To be a very real gamma. Otherwise, you see the temperature uh, is coming different. I mean, higher for gamma five third. Gamma five third is where the temperature should be low. So, so it was there. So, uh, so it, it it has to be. Composition does have an effect, but uh, not many people were very uh, very uh, enthusiastic about it. In fact, uh, in 2002, a very uh, well known relativist, Kolmigorov, uh, sorry, not Kolmigorov, um, Komisarov, Komisarov wrote a paper and said that uh, it, composition does not take any part in, in fluid behavior. Okay, so. So now when we submit these papers, we have to be very, very, very careful about not sort of attract unwanted attention from each other. But the point is that uh, actually when we actually looked at his paper, we saw that there is a lot of difference. But then again, it depends on which, which temperature range you are, you, are, you are studying. If you are in the range where the the, the uh, composition effect is not seen, so around 10 to the 8 degree Kelvin, the temperature composition is almost uh, the composition effect is almost not there. So, yeah. so anyway, so that's it. Let's talk to you for the question and answer. Question is quite clear. Okay, so I may be expressed that we want to alter the composition, you are like decreasing the fraction of protons and filling in that fraction of molecules to maintain charge neutral. So, my question is why is it necessary to maintain charge neutrality just for like mathematical simplicity? Or like no. Charge neutrality is uh, something major. We don't see large scale electricity. We see large scale magnetic. So, 
charge frequency uh, can be violated for a very short time. So uh, there is no reason why you have to take things when you are imposing charges. We are imposing charges and I'm not done. Overall, the charge will be done. The moment you have a charge separation, then the first thing is that. Having the dinner on the cloud and the heart, you have a light. So, you want this? You always uh, follow, take the adiabatic equation of steadies. You know, so like generally, throughout this, all the calculations, the, the approximation of adiabatic equation of steadies will remain the same. There's no alteration in other things. It's, it's, the equation of steadies are used. You have to say that it's an adiabatic one. No. So in the slides, if I'm not. You know, the adiabatic index. Okay, okay. Adiabatic index is uh, ratio yes, of the yes. yeah. But uh, I mean, if you look at this, you will get a better. Uh, so, like, polytropic, what is polytropic index? It, it's basically yeah. a long by long by <coughs> The polytropic index, if you actually see, it will be like DF. So, one can say it is the rate of change of the temp temperature rate of change of the average energy we have seen that the gradient of F F in the coordinate mass and the okay. you mention this QPO for C is it? And then when you are talking to companies where there is more photonomy, there is oscillation that they really take no, no, no. I, I'm pretty sure I'll find an energy uh, energy uh, <laughs> range where, uh, I mean, the combination of some other combination will have some other. In this particular case, we, sh we sh showed that a case where we have a QPO in uh, uh, electron protons, if I change the composition, okay, the, the oscillation. But it's not necessarily true that uh, different protons will have the people and uh, other people will be home. It will depend on the, uh, whether you have that, you know, the storing force and the, the balance between the storing force and the performance. <coughs> I'm still, I'm, the Asian people also like to use in the I'm not very really sure about what is that. It's vast and general. It's the same of state as the state. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Sir, uh, this was a very nice talk, thank you. Uh, Sir, I, I, I've seen a lot of people sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, uh, in one of your first slides, like, there was, there is a term, like multi -beam. Oh, uh, multi black uh, black, body. black body. Yes, yes. But the application just doesn't show black body emission. No, it's not black body. It's multi multi colored black body. Yeah. Different black body. Yes. So why are we using black body? Like, it doesn't show black body emission. So it's not black body emission, but if you sort of just. And every there is a local yeah. body, right? And it looks like a local black body. But you are, you cannot dissolve every area from the whole action is the uh, point. This one, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So basically, in uh, you you have this, okay? See this all the time. So this looks like a thermal uh, thermal emission. Okay. Now what people have seen that if you take a particular distance where you are assuming the radiation is locally in equilibrium with the this and then you solve the distance the area for the get a temperature and every temp every radius will corresponds to certain temperature it will be the value it will be found in the right so it's for our simplicity like to our for our understanding yeah modeling is like i'm trying to do that but the point is, this is 
this one, this bump is C. This is observation. Okay, now you have to explain that bump. So that bump is telling you that there is a, probably some sort of a thermal uh, radiation coming from this. Right. So now how to construct that bump? If you take a certain uh, this model, okay, there at every radius, if you, you, have, you have solved this model by assuming that the radiation is in equilibrium with the local distance. And when we when will it be equilibrium? That is the amount of radiation is giving up and is absorbing. Okay, they are they are equilibrium, right? So this is definitely thing. So then it will have a black hole. So now at every radius if you construct a black hole, then another radius if you construct another black hole. Add all of them up, you get not a black body, but you get this a slight flat and very strong. So that's why it's called multicolored black body. Not a single temperature, but multi temperature black body. Why do you call it colored? I don't know. That's the name of it. The black body itself is not colored, it has a lot of color. Thank you, sir. Any other questions?